and welcome. Steve Gerber's first major comic book work following being let go by Marvel Comics was Stuart the Rat. This original graphic novel was beautifully illustrated by his former Howard the Duck collaborator, Gene Colan, with inking done by Tom Palmer. Published in 1980 by Eclipse, Stuart the Rat starts with what amounts to a suicide note written by Stuart Drop. It chronicles his life and his research in the field of molecular biology with a focus on DNA. To make a long explanation very short, Stuart gets involved with a woman he ends up killing. He then removes her ova, inserts his and a rat's DNA into it, and then he places this concoction into a prosthetic womb for incubation. Once done, Stuart then kills himself. Three months later, out pops Stuart the rat from his metal womb. Stuart slowly adapts to the world around him. He evolves, for lack of a better term. Then, during a dream, he has an existential experience, and he wakes up to say his very first words. From there, Stuart meets Rose, who gives him a place to stay in exchange for doing chores around her ranch. Much like Howard the Duck, no one is completely freaked out by the fact that Stuart is a three-foot-tall, walking and talking rat. It's treated as unusual, but not overly concerning. With the origin and premise established, the story then deviates into the absurd. Stuart finds himself being attacked by a homicidal disco zombie. The zombie becomes inanimate only after the speaker embedded in its chest is removed. From there, Stuart and Rose presume the zombie was after Rose's daughter, Sonia, since Stuart was sleeping in Sonia's bedroom when the zombie attacked. It turns out Sonia was once involved with Wayne Fossick, a failed screenwriter who switched occupations and became a New Age cult leader. It's Wayne who sends various oddball attacks at Sonia, hoping to either enlighten her or to kill her off. Perhaps both. Stuart and Sonia confront Wayne and violence and total destruction ensues. There are a few similarities between Stuart and Howard, but not as many as one might presume. The dynamic between Stuart and Sonia develops into a similar dynamic as seen between Howard and Beverly. Like the Howard series, this graphic novel is also a satire of popular culture, more specifically aimed towards Scientology, I do believe, although it is vague enough that it could pertain to just about any alternative belief system. But these are all surface-level comparisons. I believe it would be a mistake to say that Stuart is a Howard clone, or that this graphic novel represents a Howard story that Gerber never got the chance to tell. It certainly feels distinct. Language and nudity aside, it is rather mature. More mature than the average Howard story. Also, Stuart and Howard certainly feel like different characters. Stuart is definitely more proactive than Howard, who always seem to avoid conflict. Howard is self-righteous, while Stuart is still forming. He's not had enough experience to form bitter, nihilistic opinions yet. What is interesting about this graphic novel is that it's not untethered or self-indulgent. By that I mean Gerber obviously had nearly complete control over the content, but he didn't go out of his way to be offensive or to write something so absurd that only he could understand it. Yeah, there's a good amount of adult language, but it seems natural to the conversation and to the people speaking. It's strange and satirical, but it all makes sense in its own weird way. What I'm trying to say is, it's not excessive. It's measured and well-written, as opposed to being a completely off-the-rails project by a bitter writer who finally has all the creative freedom he deserves. What is unfortunate is the fact that Gerber never returned to the character. He did later state that he thought doing another animal character immediately after Howard was a mistake. After all, he was treading similar ground as his previous success, and it probably would have helped his career more if he had done something entirely different. It's hard to disagree with this sentiment. While Stuart the Rat was a slight insult to both Marvel, who had taken Howard away from Gerber, and to Disney, who had tried to enforce ridiculous restrictions on Howard because of a non-existent resemblance to Donald Duck, Destroyer Duck was a full-on middle-finger salute to the corporate antics of both companies, and by extension, corporations in general. It is a less-than-subtle satire and parody of a company that wants to hold onto what it has and acquire everything it doesn't currently own. It's also an attack on the whole work-for-hire policy of the comic book industry, which is, for those unfamiliar with the term, a standard policy where the creative talent are paid for their work, but they must sign away all rights to that work in order to get paid. A slightly modified version of this exists at both Marvel and DC to this day, by the way. Anyway, the story of Destroyer Duck goes like this. Little Guy, that's the character's actual name, mysteriously vanishes into another universe run by Pink Primates. These primates promise to make Little Guy a star if he signs a contract with the company, God Corp. To survive, Little Guy does just that, and God Corp ends up using and abusing his uniqueness until the public gets bored of him and profits begin to drop. 
Once this occurs, Little Guy is then dissected, so Godcorp can learn how to make a more bland, consumer-friendly version of him. As Little Guy is being dissected, he pops back to his home dimension, where he is discovered by his friend, Duke Duck. As Little Guy dies, Duke Duck swears to get revenge on Godcorp. And that's the premise of the series. It's pretty obvious that Little Guy is Howard the Duck, and Godcorp is, of course, the corporate overlords of Marvel Comics. Famously, the first issue of this seven-issue series was used to fund Steve Gerber's legal action against Marvel Comics, and everyone who worked on this issue did the work for free. Even the legendary artist, Jack Kirby, worked for free. Kirby, at the time, had also left comic books and was working in animation at the same studio as Steve Gerber. I think one can reasonably speculate that Kirby, who resented Marvel and spent years trying to get his artwork back from them, was more than happy to lend his talents to this project. Oddly enough, Destroyer Duck was never meant to be an ongoing series. It was only intended to be a one-shot. But the publisher, Eclipse Comics, convinced Gerber that retailers were likely to order more of a comic if it was the first issue of an ongoing series, rather than a one-time thing. Since the point of this comic was to raise money, Gerber allowed it to be solicited as an ongoing and produced more scripts. Eventually, that is. There was a seven-month gap between the first and second issue, and six-month gaps between issues three and four. In other words, it was an ongoing series, but it wasn't exactly a priority to either Gerber or Kirby. While the series ran for seven issues, both Gerber and Kirby only stayed on for the first five. And despite Kirby being credited as the artist for issues four and five, it looks like he only did the layouts for those issues, with the bulk of the work being done by the inker, Alfredo Alcala. To be honest, the storyline between issues two and five is more interesting than the first issue. There's a manic creativity to that story that's more satisfying than the revenge-driven first issue. In the end, the five issues that Gerber and Kirby produced together are quite good. I would characterize it as a madcap satire of corporations and their properties. It's a shame they didn't work together more, actually. Kirby's character designs really go well with Gerber's oddball satirical scripts. I think Gerber plays to Kirby's strengths, which is providing visuals to strange characters and equally strange concepts. It makes one wonder what they might have created together in the 70s, had Kirby not exited Marvel at the same time that Gerber was just beginning his career. Following the end of the series, Destroyer Duck seemingly disappeared. In 1995, Gerber took over the writing chores on the Image series, codenamed Strike Force. In that series, he introduced the character, Specimen Q. This character was intended to be revealed as Destroyer Duck. Unfortunately, the editorial staff thought an anthropomorphic character was off-brand, so that idea was shot down just before the reveal, which was a pointless editorial choice since the series was cancelled before it got to that point. Regardless, the origin of Specimen Q was never revealed in codename Strike Force, so Gerber went back to his original intentions with the character in the Savage Dragon Destroyer Duck one-shot the following year. Specimen Q was revealed to be Destroyer Duck and, famously, Destroyer Duck and Savage Dragon rescued Howard the Duck from the Marvel Universe. As I mentioned in the Howard the Duck video, this was merely an intellectual victory. It was brilliantly executed, but really meant nothing in regards to the actual ownership of the Howard the Duck character. Regardless, at that point, Destroyer Duck had fulfilled his purpose. He had accomplished the one thing he was created to do from the beginning, rescue Little Guy and get revenge on the corporation that had used and abused his uniqueness. In context, it's a perfect end for the character. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.